We've moved on from painting uh, shadows across Bethesda Terrace and actually we just do a 180, turn around and we see handsome cabs passing by um, almost every minute. They stop for a few minutes to get out and look about and um, the horses take a drink or have a little snack and there's this constant parade of handsome cabs and it's a for me it's a very attractive scene I love the um, the horses of course and the riders are usually in some sort of costume that uh, is, is um, period looking and the cab that itself is decorated and adorned and, and just looks fantastic it's a great motif the problem is it's moving so having a constant source to look at is good what I'm starting with is a quick sketch on my iPad and I'm thinking about tonal values because if you notice the photograph the photograph was uh, kind of confusing in terms of lights and darks there's a lot of important dark areas against dark areas and that made it sort of hard to see so I've taken liberty in my sketch to put uh, a little bit more light behind my uh, cab in this case my motif the handsome cab will be a dark against a light and this simple decision uh, is going to make the painting look better. It's going to make it a little easier to paint. And um, it's something that I consider even before putting brush to paper is how I'm going to structure my tonal values. And color, of course, this is a color painting. It's um, um, portrayed in color, but my working thought is very much oriented towards light and dark. How am I going to use light and dark? Uh, and that helps me to uh, sort of gauge how light to keep it behind my subject. If I'm following what I see uh, with my eyes, then it's going to result in confusion. I can tell that because I've done that. I've, I've followed uh, my perceptions very, um, well, let's say rigidly or uh, exactingly and the painting ends up looking a little confusing. Confusing. So I have found that if I can identify my main subject and portray that main subject with a high degree of contrast, uh, since we have bright light, then it's a much easier read and the painting is more appealing. There's less confusion. So this simple decision of a dark subject against a light background is primary in my uh, designing this painting. I am going to make it, try to make it a more subtle expression by joining some shadows to the back of the cab, having a tree come up from behind the cab, but the horse um, as it comes towards us, the rider as it's, he's emerging from the shadows, uh, the cab itself as it's coming out of the shadows is going to be quite strong against a light background. I'm proceeding in the same way that uh, we worked with Bethesda Terrace, and that means identifying or painting some of the light hues. And uh, the light hues I'm seeing are some light yellows in the background, some blue color to the handsome cab, leaving some whites here and there, a warm hue across the pavement and uh, into the horse. And then I'm attacking the painting uh, very directly going right to my main subject and have a look how I'm using the brush. I'm holding it from the back and flicking the tip left and right, joining the dark passages, um, very conscious of the shape that I'm creating, also how the brush is expressing this shape. So I'm not filling in, rather I'm thinking of the, each brush stroke to represent sort of a positive piece of the motif, in this case the handsome cab. As I move through, I'm using a pretty much a cool gray, and in some cases while this gray is wet, I'll introduce a 
a second hue. That second hue might be a reddish hue, a warm gray. It might be neutral tint. It might be um, a paler blue. In any case, I vary the hue. I, I make an effort to change it. You, you see here how while it's wet, I add little pieces of color that will bleed out, that will change the um, rather monochromatic feeling of the wash into something a little more interesting. So this is, this is all technique, watercolor technique, um, working dry into wet as I, as I create a, a shape, the shape of the handsome cab. I modify it a little bit, I change it as I work, and I dip the brush into a, a secondary hue to get that change. And I'm concerned with uh, establishing this motif, that's why I'm painting it earlier rather than later, so that I can relate the background, so that I don't go too dark in the background, and so that I don't lose the uh, beautiful shape of the cab, the, the wheels as they move through the shadows, so I don't lo lose the figure of the horse. All this is, uh, I feel, important to the painting, and I'm stating it very, very directly at this stage, so that I can relate the future passages, the background passage, the shadows underneath, to it. This is a, a really good practice when, if you're concerned about a center of interest, a focal point, this is sort of a reliable way to build that up. Um, so establishing, uh, working from the focal point, establishing the focal point, working out from the focal point, to the, to the surrounding areas, coming back, adding more definition, more color, more um, edges and details to the focal point, moving out again to the uh, perimeter of the painting, to the background, to the foreground, building that up, returning again to finalize uh, the focal point with the focal point or the center of interest with the final details this sort of back and forth is a, a really holistic way of building the painting, one that takes into account your idea from the very beginning and allows you to return to it, and just as important, allows you to relate the other passages to it. So we started very lightly with these background washes just to establish some light tones and some some underpainting, some hues that'll shine through our future um, washes. And then right to the center of interest, really placing this um, figure, the horse, the carriage, with some precision, small brush, still holding it by the back though. You know, it's even though I'm working small, I'm trying to keep uh, a snap to the brush, a feeling of calligraphy and trying to be very suggestive in the marks. And so this figure, even though the hue is changing, is presenting a dark, uh, a dark shape, almost cut and pasted onto the, onto the background or to the to the previous layer. And this is not the final; it's a stage. And I'm in my mind, I anticipate joining this dark to the rest of the painting by means of shadows, by means of uh, shadows through the foliage, by means of a, a, a curb that we'll see, by means of the fence that we see in the back. So I've sort of thought through this process, and at this stage it looks very raw, but it doesn't bother me because I know that um, I'm going to be adding some darks to join this figure to its surroundings. It's a... Uh, way that I'm comfortable uh, painting. Some people would paint this in a different manner, perfectly fine. Uh, the only thing that really counts is the result. So they might paint uh, the background next and gradually build up to the darks, the final darks that we see in the horse and carriage, etc. I'm choosing this method because I find this back and forth between focal area and uh, surroundings to be... Mm more manageable for me, let's put it that way. So now I'm returning to the background, back to the big brush, back to a sort of broad, broad application of color, 
Of course, as I come close to the subject, I slow it down a little, avoid really uh, interfering with that main subject, um, build up the foliage with big strokes. I'll do some splatter into the upper corner. I'll approach the shadows in the same manner. And then I'll return to the, to the main subject and define it a bit more. For me, this subject is very much about this um, dark shape of carriage horse emerging from the deep shadows. So I need to place some darks uh, within the background to kind of connect it. You see me doing something of that now. Of course, I'm working into a wet area, so this is going to lighten quite a bit as it dries. But I'm thinking about this passage of light, if you can see this um, diagonal moving from the upper left towards the figure, this is sort of uh, illuminating the figure and going to draw the eye towards that uh, profile of the cab moving out of the shadows. This is what I'm counting on. It's my uh, design plan and having that uh, thought that through is a big advantage because I can kind of build on that gradually and uh, resolve um, the periphery in a manner that relates to the to the main subject. Introducing a bit of splatter, I want to keep it uh, receding into the background. I don't want it to take take over too much. So even though I go dark, I'm I'm conscious of the edges. I want the edges to be dissolving. Uh, this. Uh, this will help it to recede, even if it's um, if we have some darks that are going to be matching the darks in the the cab, we can make it recede by applying it into a wet area. One of the challenges in working with uh, this particular subject is, of course, um, it's moving. It's um, in a constant state of movement. They do pause the handsome cabs in this area. They do pause for. A short time so the uh, customer can get out and walk around and have a look down on Bethesda Terrace. In fact, the driver is gesturing towards towards a view. And the horse will take a little break, have a bucket of oats or some water, and just wait for to resume its course. And then they circle around and they just travel the park through the whole day and kind of transports us. I feel like I'm stepping back in time when I see the handsome cab. Um, I think it's a lovely addition to the park and certainly is really fun for whoever takes advantage of it, whoever takes a ride. They, they see uh, the park and the, these drivers often have a deep knowledge about what the history of the park is and um, I would think in all kinds of weather it would be enjoyable, even in the snow. I can see it being an enjoyable afternoon to go out in a handsome cab with a blanket around you. Well, you see me continuing to establish that uh, dark pattern of broken foliage up above, pushing back uh, against that corner, letting some of the sky peek through. And pretty much the background is resolved. I will do some work in the um, masonry, the fencing that comes up to meet uh, our handsome cab, but largely resolved. And now I can start to think about oh, the foreground, the shadows that are coming um, in from the painting. But before I do that, I guess I'm going to work a little bit on our horse, establishing the harness and the gear that comes across the horse. Here I'm using a very strong black. with a, might have a little bit of blue, a little bit of red mixed with it, but these elements I want to pull out from the painting to really uh, create a st strong contrast against that light background using a smaller brush to get uh, sort of an exacting stroke, but I'm still thinking of 
single strokes to define the harness, single strokes to define the ears, uh, single strokes to define the various parts that are meeting along the body of the horse. As it dries too, you can see more of the color application that was maybe a little hard to perceive in that second layer in the handsome cab. The blue is dried to a more um, a, a lighter blue that you would see if the cab was in shadows, if it was uh, shadows falling across the handsome cab. And that's a little hard to gather from the video uh, how how I perceive the color as it's being applied is different than the video shows. That's one thing that um, experience has taught me is that you kind of uh, sense how the color is going to dry by its consistency. You know which colors you've mixed, but the consistency is a big variable. If it's um, quite thin, it's going to dry quite light. It might go down looking dark, but if it's a thin application, if it's very watery, it's going to dry lighter. If it's thicker, you can estimate that it's going to dry closer to the way it looks when you first apply it. These are confusing aspects to watercolor, but they can be mastered just like anything else. So this shows you what I was talking about earlier, um, working on the main subject and then moving towards the background, then back to the main subject, bringing in some more darks to bring it out uh, from the background. Next, after this stage, I'll be working in the foreground and then I'll make a final return to adjust um, the background. I'm sorry, the, the main motif. I think I saw this particular cab uh, while I was painting maybe two times, so he made a circle around the park and I became familiar with the horse which has a blaze. The blaze is the white triangle that comes down the forehead. This is a really useful part of the horse. I would say the ears and the blaze are quite useful because they can really show you a lot of what you want to see with the with the horse that's moving. How the head is positioned, uh, how that front part of the face comes down to the to the nose so that's what I look for if the horse doesn't have a blaze oftentimes I'll add one because I feel it, uh, it adds clarity to a, especially to an animal that has a lot of color or is dark what you see me adding now is some of the balustrades to the, to the stone fencing that moves behind uh, our subject and actually leads down to the Bethesda Terrace so it's a it's a marker saying this is Central Park. It's pretty unique to Central Park, and it's a part of the the vision of Olmsted and others who worked on the park to to make it a grand place, a place that's um, a grand park. Let's put it that way. And these darks are very much related to the darks in the cab. So it's another example of extending some of what we have in our motif outward, connecting our motif, our main subject of horse and carriage to the background, um, and then returning and adding more definition to our main subject. we go we're painting the big shadow and if you remember the shadow from the previous example of the Bethesda Terrace I have very much the same mindset I'm trying of course to show the angle of light at the same time very calligraphic I want a dappled effect and it's important for me to obscure some parts that were clear uh, and the underside of the carriage and the horses feet and hooves and join this dark passage by means of shadows to the right-hand side. 
and the painting is starting to assume that finished quality. From this point, it's mostly detail work. Um, I'll add some touches to the horse and carriage, of course. I'll add some, I might lift some uh, area behind the canopy of the carriage just to get a more, little more light there. I'll definitely add some highlights to shoulders and to the top of the carriage, to some of the spokes on the wheel to bring them out from the, from the dark shadows. I'm trying to get a little bit of a gradation to my shadow area. That's why I'm adding a little stronger color right underneath the cab. Then as the shadow comes forward, it slightly it lightens just a bit. I find it to be a fun challenge to, to paint this sort of subject because it's moving, because it's animated. Um, it's a more of a challenge, but I find it to be a subject that I, I like returning to. Uh, certainly, I like to put it in the context of Central Park. And as per usual, I'm thinking very much about the light, how the light affects the subject. This is the finished piece. I've added a bit more red to the feather on top of our horse, some highlights to the figures, some flowers to the handsome cab. The spokes I've kind of regained by adding a bit of white to them uh, using the Jean Brilliant or titanium white right from the tube. And I feel I realized uh, my initial uh, idea, which was this uh, dark figure, this dark uh, horse and carriage to be coming out of the shadows, uh, light passing behind them so that we can show our handsome cab with clarity. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm going to try one more. Uh, as per usual, you can read the description, uh, get some further information on this scene and technique. You can uh, visit my webpage to see more photos of our trip to New York City. You can find my web address in the description. You can find my Instagram page in the description. And you can uh, contact me through my website, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So let's do another handsome cab. <laughs>